I'm Mark Reith, and joining me in studio today from Million Dollar Portfolio, Jason Moser. Jason, how's it going? Howdy. Happy Tuesday. Hey, happy Tuesday to you. Yeah. Uh, we got plenty to get to today, including some comments from Tim Cook that don't exactly make things look good over at Apple. <laughs> but we begin with earnings, and Jason, why don't we start with New York Times? Uh, we've been telling the same story about newspapers for a while now. You know, money is heading in the opposite direction. Uh, paper is the way of the past. Print is dead. Uh, but New York Times showing a little spark of life this quarter. You're gonna have some big print fans, some pro print people that are going to say, how dare you, Mark? Reith? Radio, print isn't dead. Radio at fool.com. <laughs> Send them my way. Send them via email, because Just print is dead. Facing, uh, Definitely facing some challenges there. Um, we, had, we had talked about this, I guess, a little bit a couple of weeks ago in regard to the big Gannett acquisition recently. You start looking at the bigger question today is, is what's worth more? Um, the information that you're getting or the brand that's giving it to you. And right. I think for the longest time, the brand was was very important because it sort of signified a, a reputation um, and it earned trust. Um, I think as time goes on, you sort of see a lot of these brands sort of maybe skew to one political side of the spectrum or the other. Mm-hmm. And so then you have your, your sort of you pick and choose your side. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And, and, and I think that's fine. There's no big deal with that. But I think that, that generally speaking, what, what the internet has done has disrupted virtually everything that we do in our lives. Newspapers, indeed, uh, fall in this category. I think when you look at the New York Times, uh, I mean, the good news for them, that they've, they've made this pivot away from print and towards digital media subscriptions. Um, and and circulation is growing in right. that in that regard, so that's a positive. I think the bad news is though that the company, there there are a number of bad bad point uh, bad bad points. There's some challenges they have to deal with. Is they're dependent on advertising as part of their a part, part of their well, revenue it's a newspaper, generation. Yeah, and and advertising um, is. It's it's dwindling. It's becoming less and less a piece of the pie, which isn't good. I mean, we look at uh, this quarter, advertising was thirty. Seven percent of, of total revenue mm-hmm. a year ago it was thirty nine percent. The year before that it was forty one percent. So they're becoming more and more dependent on uh, paying subscribers, and that's fine if you can grow paying subscribers. And they are growing their paying subscribers. But when you look at the actual subscription revenue, the subscription revenue is growing far more slowly than the actual subscribers, which would indicate a a lack of pricing power. And now that's not surprising. We don't have to really make a leap to to get there. But then you have to start asking yourself. I mean, from an investor's perspective, is this something that uh, is really worth, you know, in investing your your capital in? And I, I mean, I, I see enough challenges here uh, to where, I, I mean, I think really the best the best opportunity for anybody in this space is going to be consolidation. And mm-hmm. I think I think we're watching that that shake out now. And I think that the New York Times is going to have to be a part of some type of consolidation in order to make it a more attractive story for investors. Because as as it stands today, I just don't really see um, enough there to, to make investors uh, excited about the years to come. Yeah, they're clearly trying to make investors excited. Yeah. They've got some big promises, uh, and one of them, I pulled this from their earnings, uh, so they generated $400 million in revenue through online advertising and subscriptions in 2014. They want to double that to $800 million by 2020. Well, which, I want a toilet made of gold, Mark, but it doesn't necessarily mean it's going to happen. <laughs> when, when you've got other companies like Facebook, for Pete's sake, is, is struggling with online advertising right now, it is, I think you said this earlier, it is a large pie, but it's getting divided up very quickly between some large companies out there. New York Times is going to be fighting for the same ad revenue that you know Facebook with their news feed now. They're trying to become the New York Times of the internet. Uh, and Facebook, or excuse me, New York Times is going to have to, to, to fight them on that. On, on Facebook's home turf, uh, I don't see 400 million turning into 800 million in six years. I don't see it happening in 20 years for, for New York Times. <laughs> yeah. uh, I mean, I, I tend to agree with you there. I think that the I think that this I think this landscape only becomes more and more competitive. And when you have uh, platforms out there like Facebook and Twitter and Instagram and Snapchat and maybe even LinkedIn to a lesser degree. Mm-hmm. Um, competing for all of those digital eyeballs, yeah. I mean, to, for 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 the New York Times to to be able to grow advertising revenue at that kind of a rate seems like a stretch. I think it's gonna it's gonna boil down to consolidation in the industry. I think there are gonna be more partnerships reached with 
a lot of those major platforms uh, in order to potentially offer some revenue sharing there that could, that could uh, be beneficial mm-hmm. for for them down the road. But it's I mean it's just a far different uh, space than it was even ten years ago. Right. And and uh, unfortunately, the New York Times was built in a different time on a different premise, right? Um, it, it's not as nimble or as savvy as a lot of these new age uh, media companies are, and, and I think that's where a lot of its challenges are gonna are gonna be for a while. Real quick, let's speculate wildly. Who hey. buys the New York Times? What conglomerate does the New York Times become a part of? We saw, you know, a lot of media companies, like you said, are are, are combining forces these days. I think uh, Comcast just bought DreamWorks uh, the other day, right? Uh, so, yes, is it so far afield to say that one day the New York Times and I don't know. Let, let's throw some other. Uh, Warren Buffett owns a whole bunch of newspapers out there as well. Is it so crazy to say Warren Buffett gobbles up the New York Times someday? Uh, again, speculating wildly. What are your thoughts? Yeah, on the I don't think that's necessarily as crazy. I don't think that's probably as big of a leap. I think uh, Buffett's he likes newspapers a lot, and I think he really likes going down to the local level. Mm-hmm. I think when you look at it from a national level, that's probably where more competition is. But really, that local level—that's where I think probably those local those local tabloids have have a little bit of a better uh, advantage because they're really the only ones covering that space. And I mean, that's a really good question. Like, I mean, I mean, Jeff Bezos bought the Washington Post for um, himself. I mean, it's not an Amazon-owned business, right. but um, it is it is a Bezos-owned business, and it's becoming more and more a part of Amazon's model. So, I mean, I don't think it would be all that far fetched to see a digital property consider um, bringing something like the New York Times under its wing in order to to bring some more um, national media savvy. Uh, possibly, I mean, I I don't know. I mean, let's yeah, speculate yeah. wildly. Speculate perhaps wildly. Google. I mean, perhaps Facebook. I mean, I I don't know that I necessarily see that happening, but if it, it wouldn't shock me if it did. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, okay, let's move on to Grubhub, which also announced earnings uh, earlier. Uh, a bit of a mixed bag here, you know. Uh, quarterly revenue was up, uh, net income was down. What's your takeaway from the earnings report from Grubhub? Yeah, so I think the crucial part of the equation for anyone looking to compete in this market, it's all going to revolve around customer service. I mean, hmm. this is a customer service deal right here because when you're having your food delivered, you really want two things. You want it in a timely fashion, and you want the right order. Mm-hmm. And if you if you miss out on either one of those, it really creates a bad experience, and you're not as likely to use that service again. So I think with Grubhub, this is a really interesting space because Grubhub, like this is what they do. Mm-hmm. This is this is the advantage that they have. This is what they do. So when you look at the competition in the space, something like Amazon, for example, in their Prime Now offering, they are getting more into this space. I'd worry about Amazon to the degree that it's the, the mandate of the, of the business, the mission of the business, is to be the most customer centric uh, company on the face of the earth. Right. Um, on the flip side, there you look at other competitors like uh, Uber, Postmates, DoorDash. Uber, I'm 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 a little bit more on the skeptical side as far as Uber being able to incorporate this into their model and being as effective with it. I think Uber does does something very well in in getting people from point A to point B. Mm-hmm. I don't know that it's necessarily as easy to leverage that infrastructure and throw food into the mix. Um, it it could it could ultimately work out for them, but again, I mean, I think it's not their specialty. It's not what they do. We are seeing. Um, Partnerships with companies like Postmates. I think Postmates is the one that's partnering with Chipotle. Right, and I'm sure that more, more, uh, and more partnerships partnerships like that will shake out. But I think that Grubhub they went public at a very good time. So now they're there. I mean, they've got that funding and they're out there. All of these others are still private, with the exception of Amazon, and so they have to deal with raising more and more capital, kind of building out the business. There are a lot of attractive qualities, I think, about Grubhub. Really, I mean, this is kind of a pure play. There, it's a big market opportunity. You've got some estimates out there of a seventy billion dollar takeout market here domestically. Um, now, that's not their market opportunity, but they're going to measure uh, total food sales, and their revenues are going to be a part of those total food sales. Right. Um, all of the metrics are trending in the right direction. I mean, they they have a solid balance sheet. They're profitable. They're cash flow positive. Shares are actually trading at a semi reasonable level at 32 times full year non GAAP mm-hmm. estimates. Mm-hmm. So it's not like it's really all that outrageous of a stock right now. 
yeah, it's going to be a very competitive environment for sure. But which is actually what I want to come back to. And you mentioned this right at the top. In fact, you actually said something about the New York Times earlier that I that I. Uh, wanted to go back to as well. Uh, you talked about information versus brand, and sure. how in the news industry, brand used to be everything, and now information's everywhere. So brand has been, you know, it's it's less important. Right. Uh, I kind of feel like it's almost the same thing here with Grubhub and its competitors, and that's what you were talking about at the beginning of this portion of the of the show, where Grubhub, to me, uh, so I've used Grubhub. I used it this past weekend. I also used uh, Eat24, which is right. a Yelp product, and I think I used that like two weeks ago or so. Just in case you didn't know, I'm about 75% of this market, <laughs> this Eat In market. It's all me at there this you point. Go. <laughs> uh, but it, it, in my mind, the two are interchangeable. Even yeah. on le- even in terms of uh, offerings of the different different types of food out there, even in terms of the service and just delivery times and everything. Uh, to my mind. There's not much differentiation between brand uh, or information at this point. You can get food from anywhere. You can get food from any of these different services out there. Uh, if I can call an Uber from a bar and have them have a pizza in that car on my way home, that's the that's the golden ticket right there. That's beautiful. So I guess it comes down to for me, and maybe there is no correct answer here, but what differentiates Grubhub. Why why Grubhub over all the others? Again, their business sounds great. You've been giving us some great numbers here. It doesn't sound like Grubhub's a bad investment. Just is there a moat? Is there any sort of a way for it to distinguish itself from the competition? I think the quickest way to building any kind of a moat is to have the biggest network. Mm. I think that with any of these businesses really having the biggest network is going to be a great way to sort of separate yourself from your competitors. So whether I'm in Georgia or California, I could use Grubhub and I'm going to find a large selection of restaurants where I can get basically whatever I want because yeah, ultimately you're kind of looking for the food first and sort of how you get it is going to be secondary. Hmm. And and back to sort of the newspaper conundrum there. I mean, I think you're going to see consolidation being a part of this industry as well and Grubhub uh, which also owns Seamless, mm-hmm. um, and they just made another acquisition here of a of a uh, Los Angeles based uh, delivery Saw company as well. Whenever, yeah. And so I think we're going to see a lot of a lot of uh, network building here early on. I think it's kind of the wild west wild west right now, and, and so that's going to be I think the biggest advantage. And, and I think that's an advantage that Grubhub certainly has over over other uh, businesses that haven't been able to go public yet because they're going to be a little bit more constrained financially. Um, and, and as your network grows, really those network effects start to take place. Other restaurants see you as being the, the the company with the biggest network and really the most reliable service, and then you can kind of develop a brand from that. Right. Um, so they, they kind of work together. I think it's really going to be building that network out, and, and the faster they can do that, uh, the more the more of a competitive advantage, or at least a, some sort of a moat they'd, they'd be able to develop. And and after that, then really, it just becomes about execution, making sure you're providing that great service, and making sure that that you really are focused on that. Because it's easy for companies in the in the early years to be customer centric. Um, it's another thing to really sustain that behavior and grow it. Customer service is one of those things that it's difficult because it's really not so scalable, right? Mm. I mean, you you need generally you're looking for that human interaction. Which is why I'm generally a bit skeptical of these bots that we hear so much about. I think they can provide certain things, like you could find out the hours that a restaurant is open, perhaps. But if you're having an issue with a service or whatever, you're probably going to need to interact with a person. Right. And and so I think that uh, service again is is going to going to prove out to be a very important dynamic to this market. All right, let's move on to our final topic of the day, which is Apple. Uh, Tim Cook, Apple CEO, went on Kramer the other night, uh, trying to you know uh, convince investors and shareholders that everything's a okay. And one of his quotes that you sent to me before the show, uh, and I'm quoting here, Tim Cook: "We are going to give you things that you can't live without, that you just don't." No, you need today. Yeah. Well, Jason, I just don't know what the hell he's talking about. <laughs> well, I, I, we've, he's been saying that they've been saying over at Apple that they the pipeline is strong, that there are more products coming, the next iPhone, the next iPad, the next whatever. Uh, I, I the watch was an attempt at that. I think that largely has flubbed. Uh, I'm I'm not confident personally in Apple's pipeline, and I think that's 
drawing a lot of fire from investors these days. What's your take, uh, first of all, on Tim Cook's comments uh, from the show the other night? Yeah, I think uh, I, so. Apple's. I think with Apple, let's separate the stock from the business, right? Okay. Because I think they 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 each deserve their own fair consideration. I mean, from a business perspective, this is a phenomenal company, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, it's huge balance balance sheet of a of, of just a fortress there, and um, a lot of different resources and ways they can go. And it's obviously one of the most important businesses of our time. Apple the stock, though, yeah, I mean, that's a bit of a different story right mm-hmm. now. And, and I'm not sure that there is an easy answer there. I mean, I, I am growing a little bit tired of hearing Tim Cook say that as well. Like, I mean, I, he's, he's every call, you know, he, he's talking about the pipeline and these products that you're going to need that you don't even know you need. And that sort of sounds familiar because I think that's what Jobs was always really good at doing was giving us things we didn't even really know we yeah, wanted or needed. Just one more thing. And yeah, just one more thing. And, and I mean, I think that it, a lot of people are investing in Apple these days because they think it's dirt cheap and they think that that's a reason to invest. Okay. And I get that. I'm not necessarily disagreeing with the idea that it is cheap. It sells for something like ten times earnings, and backing the cash out of the balance sheet there, it's pretty phenomenal. Mm -hmm. By the same token, I think that a lot of this story is very well known already. We know they're going to pay a dividend. We know they're going to keep on buying back shares. I think a lot of that is priced in. Uh, Maybe not all of it, but I think a lot of it is because the market generally is a forward-looking mechanism. And with Tim Cook, I think that Tim Cook has done a wonderful job in managing this business. I think Tim Cook is not an innovator. And I'm not saying innovating is easy either. I mean, I think innovating is something that is very unique, and that's why you don't see it happening all the time. If it was easy, everybody would be doing it. Um, so I think Tim Cook is basically doing the best he can. I think he's making the best of, of, of a given situation. Mm-hmm. And, and I don't know that it's fair to really expect much more from him. Um, I tend to agree with you. I think the I think the watch is probably going to be. I think it's it's done basically what I always kind of thought it would do. It's done okay. Sure. It's not going to be a, a new direction for the company. I don't think. I think they're facing a lot of challenges on the tablet front. I think uh, the phone is is certainly becoming more and more commoditized as time goes on. And I think that as technology improves and more companies out there are doing more things, I think that Apple's sort of closed ecosystem becomes less attractive. Mm. Um, I think that most people like to be able to utilize all of the options that are out there. A number of people love Apple and only want to use Apple. That's great. Mm-hmm. Have at it. But a number of people also want to be able to use everything else that's out there and, and maybe have an iPhone while they're at it. And that's cool, too. Um, I, I think that you look at the stock. You know, I saw a tweet from Joe Mager maybe a week ago or so that I think really sort of sums this all up. And you look at when Tim Cook took over in 2011, I believe it was, they first implemented a dividend in 2012. You look at that stock from 2012 to today, Mm -hmm. and it's clearly underperformed the market, Hmm. Um, even with the dividend and buying back the shares and everything. And, And I think that's for a number of reasons, but I think part of it is it's obviously a very big company. Um, they are trying to sell hardware at a high price point, which is not going to work everywhere. And there's a reason why the majority of the world is using Android and not Apple, because I think uh, people tend to want to be able to utilize uh, all of the options that are out there. So, I think Apple stands the chance to do very well. I think they're going to need to make some acquisitions. I think a catalyst could be in that balance sheet because so much of that money is overseas. Um, I'd love to see our government here offer up a tax holiday and let some of these companies repatriate some of that cash. Sure, I think they could do a lot of great things with it, and shareholders could really win from that. Who knows what's going to happen on that front? I, I do think that a lot of people are probably getting a little bit tired of sort of the just wait. We've got a great pipeline talk because you know what? I'm just not seeing it yet. Been waiting for a long time. Yeah. Apple shares closed down for an eighth straight day yesterday, which might just be a, a non headline, but it's the headline today. Uh, that's the first time this has happened since July 1998. The stock has lost 11% since April 26th. In your mind, it's looking a little cheap. Is now the time to buy? I think if you're looking for a steady dividend play that you can sleep well at night knowing is in your portfolio. I think Apple is a very fine stock to own. 
you have to put it into context too and try to figure out how does this stock double. Hmm. I mean, it's already a huge company, so you need to keep your expectations in check. This is a far different Apple than it was five years ago. But I think it's a it's a it's a great company that's doing great things, and I think they have a lot of opportunities to take the business in new directions. Um, so, yeah, I wouldn't be backing up the truck on the stock today. I think that it's cheap for a reason, mm-hmm. and I don't know that there's necessarily a catalyst that takes this thing to the moon. Um, but it's a very high quality business, and I think again, I think Tim Cook has done a very fine job um, given the situation. He's he's not Steve Jobs. We all knew that. I think uh, that's the biggest challenge for him is trying to figure out what the next innovations are. And he's got a great team there. It's just probably taking a little bit more time than a lot of people uh, feel like they have. <laughs> Waiting and seeing and hoping and wishing and praying. Hey, I still like my iPhone. Sure, sure. Nothing wrong with that. Not at all. All right. Jason Moser, thanks for being here, man. Thank you. As always, people on the program may have interest in the stocks they talk about, and The Motley Fool may have formal recommendations for or against. So don't buy or sell stocks based solely on what you hear. That's it for this edition of Market Foolery. The show is mixed by Dan Boyd. I'm Mark Reith. Thanks for listening. We'll see you tomorrow.